Hello, world, and welcome to Coffee and Comics, the show where we drink coffee and talk about comics. I'm Aaron. And I'm Garrett. And today we're going to be talking about frame stories and drinking death cups from Death Wish Coffee Company. Death Wish is an organic, fair trade coffee with subtle notes of chocolate and cherry, and it claims to be the world's strongest coffee. I don't know what they mean by strongest. Are they talking caffeine, or they just mean like the dark roast? I don't know. Or what metric they use. Is it European, American? Regardless, it, it is a pretty dark roast. If you like Italian roasts, you probably would like this. You can pick up Death Wish Coffee at a local grocery store or at deathwishcoffee.com. Links in the description below. You know, someone asked us how we like to take our coffee. Garrett, how do you take yours? I prefer my coffee black, nothing in it. I like mine black and sweet, and served in an awesome mug. So what is a frame story anyways? A frame story is an introductory narrative that sets the stage for one or more other stories to be nestled within it. It's a literary conceit often used to create an anthology that informs the reader about aspects of the main story in which they take place. Or they can be indirectly related to the principal series in which they're set, like the World's End collection of Neil Gaiman's Sandman. They can act as commentary for the narrative frame and can be used to sum up or encapsulate relevant aspects of the outer narrative. Kind of like the Meta Barons. It's the intergalactic story of a bloodline of super warriors as told by the robot butler of the most recent Meta Baron. Exactly. Framing can also be used to position the reader's attitude toward the tale or suggest the reader's reaction to the story according to the reaction the characters in the frame have to the story they're told. Kind of like the Princess Bride. We're Fred Savage. And the narrator's Peter Falk. And we're not feeling very good, and Grandpa's got a story to make us feel better. A main goal of the frame story can be to collect otherwise disparate tales into one volume for the delight of the reader. Much like A Thousand and One Nights, where each story we read is a story that Scheherazade uses to get herself one more night before she's executed. To act as a frame, the story must be used as an occasion for the introduction to and telling of other stories such as Warren Ellis' series, The Global Frequency. Warren Ellis' masterful series. Today, we're looking at three relatively recent releases that use a sandwich-style, story-within-a-story structure. Some better than others. When creating a frame, you have to set the stage for your framing, which means you need to pick a narrator. Narration is an important part of telling the events of a plot. Either we know who's narrating, which makes it justified narration, or we don't, which just makes me mad. Now, there are two types of first-person narrators, reliable and unreliable. Reliability is determined by whether or not the person telling the story is credible. It's usually assumed that the narration is reliable until something is shown to prove that it's not. And then there's also something called the Rashomon effect, which suggests that no first-person narration is ever truly reliable unless they're Peter Falk. But for today, we are going to assume that the narration given to us is provided by credible narrators. Which might make an ass out of you and me. First up, we have Talk Stories from Marjorie Liu's and Sana Takada's Monstrous. Published November 25th by Image, it's a companion book that focuses on Kippa, a principal character in the main series. In the talk story, Kippa recounts an important event from her past that gives us greater understanding into how she became who she is in the main series. The flashback starts on a page turn from page three to page four. Now, Marjorie Liu doesn't make it immediately clear that we've transitioned into a flashback. There's no text box, there's no uh, anything announcing that we've gone through a time shift. Instead, the artist Sana Takeda gives us a nice change in the negative space between the panels. In the flashback, the panels switch to a white outline and black margin, the opposite of what we had in the framing scene. It's funny because it's a frame story and she literally changes the panel frames. But there is a problem with it. The first page of Kippa's story doesn't make the change. It's not until the second page that we see it. Honestly, it almost seemed like an editing error. But she does make up for it at the end because there's a really slick transition out of the story and back into the present. She uses this nice little gradient shift on the borders to go back to the original style. Now, even though Kippa relives the inner story within a story through a reliable first-hand account, there's no actual narrator. Instead, the frame is provided by her conversation with Lady Halfwolf in the outer story of Monstrous. 
This is important to note because the primary narrator in the Monstrous series is Lady Half-Wolf, not Kippa, and suddenly swapping narrators would be strange. That's also why Talk Stories serves as a companion piece and not an oblique tangent. Lady Half-Wolf is actually experiencing it, so it all takes place within the greater context of the main story. Talk Stories Part 2 comes out December 30th. Go check it out. The second story we'll look at today is from Ghosts, a collection of stories from Jim Henson's Storyteller series. Put out by Archaea on November 24th, Ghosts is 128 pages and consists of a collection of four different stories by four different writer-artists. Each was released as an individual issue, but was intended to be included in this thematic collection. That makes Ghosts a collected anthology where there is seemingly no chronological outer narrative to contain the individual issues. Instead, the narrative continuity exists solely by virtue of a shared narrator who is portrayed somewhat differently by different authors. It's a serial, not a series, kind of like Tales from the Crypt or The Twilight Zone. Another interesting thing about the framing of the narration in Ghosts is the relationship between the storyteller and his dog, which is used to position our attitude towards the tale. Each story is told as a reaction to something the dog does that we are almost always intended to be at odds with. Today, we'll be focusing on the last story in the book, which is The Promise by Ver. Ver? V-E-R? Someone in the comments let us know. The storyteller narrates in omniscient past tense, and he doesn't include himself in the narrative, so we can regard the narration as reliable. His narration serves to provide context, fill in information we may lack, and answer questions we might have. As a story within a story, the promise, and every story in the storyteller series, lives up to the reason the storyteller told it to his dog in the first place. The Promise itself is a good example of a sandwich story, but Ghosts as an anthology is also a frame narrative, even though the individual stories might be just loosely related to each other. Lastly, we have DC's Dark Knight's Death Metal The Multiverse Who Laughs, released on November 24th. It crams five stories into 48 pages. Uh, ten of which are ads. And features a total of eight writers and 11 artists of various types. Pencils, inks, and colors. That's 19 people on one book. Oh, don't forget the five letterers. Okay, that's 24 people working and on one issue. the cover artist, the variant cover artist, the editor. Okay, stop. Stop. Look. Talk Stories had two people on it, Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. Ghosts, it's got four stories in it, but each one's written and drawn by one person. The Promise, there. Yeah, this got 24 people. Too many cooks. The reason we picked this up at the comic shop was because of the cover. We had no idea what was going on in the death metal universe, and a number one looked like a good place to start. Who oh boy, were we wrong. I mean, Talk Stories, it tells us one of two. Uh, the Promise tells us four of four. The Dark Knight's death metal, The Multiverse Who Laughs, has a one on it. Which would imply that it's one of an ongoing series, but... But it's not. It's just kind of a one-off side book to what's going on in the gigantic DC death metal meta plot. Instead, it aims to be an anthology of short stories nested within the death metal universe and our intro is just a paragraph on the inside cover telling us that the Robin King is going to narrate these stories. Except he doesn't provide narration. Each of those individuals' stories has their own narrator. So then we expect to be Robin King to be kind of like Jim Henson's The Storyteller and provide a frame for each of the stories, but he doesn't do that either. All he does is recap some of the things happening in the outer story of death metal that are all way cooler than what happens in this book. And then he leaves us hanging by breaking the fourth wall and asking us if we're ready to turn the page because the horrors out there are ready for us. Except there's not even a page turn. This whole book is dishonest. The Robin King is just infuriating. He's condescending and gives us four pages of cock tease where he teases 12 different stories that aren't even related to what's happening in the book. He keeps giving us setup and okay, bro. No, I mean this guy. He's like, hey, do you do you want to hear about this story? And then doesn't tell us that. He's like, oh, but you already know about this other story. He doesn't tell us. And by the way, I don't know that story. I would like to know that story. He just. All right, let's continue on about the with the first story after this introduction. The one about Victor's ass. Yes. 
The story is sort of clever and introduces us to Gottlieb Arkham, a bizarro version of Amadeus Arkham, who's portrayed as a kindler and gentler doctor, which winds up making him more disturbing. You know, this is actually an interesting premise, but it's kind of hard to focus when you've got a page turn into a freaking Snickers ad. I mean, you've got five different stories in here. You could have put it between any one of those, and instead you put it right smack dab in the middle of Feeding the Beast? I mean, come on, do you have any idea how distracting that is? No. I see your point. Dude, you're not yourself. <laughs> you're angry. Oh, God, is that why it's called Feeding the Beast? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, if that's the case, that's quite subtle, but we might be just inferring way too much from this piece. <laughs> the fact that we have to go through this whole elaborate setup for a bad pun. The story serves as a cautionary tale of the German variety with a message for Zaz. Be careful what you wish for. That's a generous take. Well, it's kind of funny because in the 12 pages of setup, it reveals that Gottlieb is German for Amadeus. I mean, maybe, or it is, look, I don't care about any of that. It, the, the time management here is pretty awful. I mean, you do have 12 pages here, but they fill up a lot of that with just kind of useless uh, illustrations that just aren't very good. You've got some close-ups of some pretty scratchy drawing of Zaz. Then you get a pretty decent uh, shot of the, the front of Arkham. And then we get some page turns into like some large illustrations of Zaz and Kite Man just doodling. They're not something I want to look at. It's just poorly mismanaged real estate. The story is the inner monologue of a madman, but he dies before the end. So the narration is completely unresolved. And Gottlieb has to tie it up with this epilogue called New Friends. A single page which has the condiment king on it. <laughs> and that sees an off-panel text bubble with the words, kill me, at the very end. As if it's implying that it's something I should be saying. I guess you should read this comic if you have a death wish. Mm, ah. Bad product placement. Mm. Like the Snickers <laughs> ad. Super Threats is a mildly coherent story with some pretty solid art. It's the story that I was least interested in, but it actually turned out to be probably my favorite of the lot. Funny thing is that there's a flashback within the Super Threat story, which is narrated by Beppo the Super Chimp. So it's a story sandwiched within another story nested in an anthology that's part of a larger story. Yeah, the Super Threats is narrated by the Super Dog, but then the flashback is narrated by Beppo, so it really does get confusing. Hard Traveled, the next story, is about Green Lantern and Green Arrow, but it doesn't get its title box to the very end, so you might confuse it for being part of the story before. And it's only four pages long. And that's two pages less than the full six that the Robin King gets to jerk us around. And it's literally just a premise. It has no story and no ending. I mean, it kind of reminds me about your rule of taking a trip somewhere. If you're going to a destination, you should make sure that your time at the destination is longer than the trip. They say that the journey, you know, it's the journey, not the destination, but anyone who said that has never driven to Ohio. To its credit, the art's not bad, but the story ends with them posing to fight. And I'm still kind of confused about where the Green Arrow keeps his bow after he tries to calm down the Green Lantern with both hands. Don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. I mean, I would love an answer to that question. I'd love an answer to any of the questions I have on this book. In Fear Index, the story is about why Steel's immune to fear gas. We're told masks are protection against the gas, and he wears one, but apparently his doesn't work that way, and he's actually immune because of his ancestry. I mean, the art just doesn't seem to com communicate any of this story. The line is, but how? And the kid that Steel saved is just kind of gawking at his mask. We get a transition to this close-up on the mask, and... That's supposed to explain it. But the kid wouldn't know, looking at Steel's mask, that Steel's mask doesn't work. I mean, heck, we as the audience don't know. It looks like it has a rebreather. It looks like it's high tech. They so, just kind of leave that to nothing? And use it as a way to transition into him telling us why he's immune to fear. Awkwardly mask. transitioning. Right. One of the biggest problems with Dark Knight's death metal, The Multiverse Who Laughs, is, as an anthology, if you can call it that, is that it's completely open-ended. But if I had to identify the, the biggest problem, I'd say it's this book's awful time management. I mean, Robin's intro takes up way too much time, and the premises for all the other stories 
don't have the pages to properly introduce themselves. I think any of these premises could have been really cool, but trying to accomplish a readable story and the balance of art to words, it's just impossible with the constraints the book gives itself. So in Talk Stories, Kippa closes issue one by ending a flashback and we shift our attention back to Lady Half-Wolf in the present. We get that great panel transition. In Ghosts, every storyteller book is bookended by returning to the storyteller and his dog for a resolution of the narrative frame. In Talk Stories, we get three pages of intro and one page of resolution. In The Promise, we have one and one. The only thing that comes after the Fear Index is eight more pages of ads. I mean, heck, they could have even brought back the Robin King just to finish the frame, but they didn't. Because, I mean, he doesn't even narrate any of the stories. It, it seems, seems he was never intended to be the narrator for the anthology. That's the problem. So if you were going to fix the multiverse who laughs in as few rewrites as possible, what would you focus on? I would focus on the role the Robin King plays and how the narration is framed. I would shorten the introduction that he gets. Kind of distill it down. Right. And then bring him back at the end of each one of the, the framed stories mm -hmm. to introduce the next one. I'd even have him do the narration in those stories so that we can maintain proper narrative context. You cut down the pages he gets. You could actually give some of those to the stories that are starved for pages. Without giving them a Snickers ad. <sighs> <laughs> narration is obviously an essential part of these books, but it applies to all comics in general. Narrative context can make or break a story, so just don't skimp on your framing. Anyway, we hope you liked our episode on framing. If you'd like to see more content like this, be sure to check out the next issue of Coffee and Comics. Don't forget to like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and tune into the frequency. We'll see you next time.